This is part two of sky motions based on the motion of Earth itself. And I had this all as one presentation, but I didn't want to exceed 15 minutes and I was already at 20 minutes, so I'll try and do a little better. It's a little bit hard for me to keep this really short. There's a lot of detail that I don't want to miss, but we can't cover it all. So in any case, the Earth, as you probably know, moves around the sun. And that's pretty significant. While it's doing that, it's spinning on its axis. The direction of the axial, the axis itself, is toward Polaris. And so as it migrates around the sun, which takes an entire year, the axis of Earth is always pointing to Polaris. Polaris is so far away that the 93 million miles, or one astronomical unit of radial distance from one side and then the same distance to the other side, is insignificant in terms of changing the direction that this or where that points to. There's no noticeable perceptional change in in how it points to Polaris, the North Star. Hope that made sense. So the distance is one astronomical unit. There's what it corresponds to 150 million kilometers. And it's really moving out as it orbits around the Sun, about 107 kilometers per hour, 107,000 kilometers per hour, which is pretty much incomprehensible for our standard reference frames of speed in our daily lives. Taking a broader view, observing the motion of the Earth around the Sun, and considering the implications of that with the view of the background stars as well. We know that the Earth goes around the Sun, so there it goes. It's migrating counterclockwise around the Sun. And well, you may also know that at any particular place, like let's look at January 1st, if you look toward the Sun, behind the Sun there's a constellation. You may recognize these as the zodiacal constellations. Well, the view from January 1st, you see the Sun in the constellation Sagittarius. January, February, March. In March, as we migrate around, the Sun is in Aquarius. So there it is. So that has to do with your zodiacal sign. We'll talk more about that in the next presentation. But the implications of what we see from Earth are pretty significant. It takes one year to go around. And we don't see the constellations that the Sun are in because it's too bright. The Sun is producing so much glare. We see the constellations in the other direction. So in March, we're seeing Leo, January, Gemini, and then here's some summer constellations, and then we go toward the fall, etc. There's a special name given to the path that Earth takes around the sun. And just to it's an important to understand as we go forward that as the Earth goes around the Sun, it seems like the Sun is going around us, right? So imagine the Earth going around the Sun, which it actually does. From our point of view, it looks like the Sun is orbiting around us like this, or going from west to east. So there's a eastward migration of the Sun around the Earth from the point of view of Earth. Hopefully that makes sense. It's equivalent ways of looking at what's going on. The path of the Earth around the Sun is called the ecliptic, and in like manner we can think of that ecliptic as the projection of Earth's orbit onto the celestial sphere, okay, or equivalently the apparent path of the Sun as viewed from Earth. So where's the Sun? The Sun is on the ecliptic, and the ecliptic plane which is the plane formed from this circle, is very significant in terms of its relationship to the celestial equator, the plane produced by the celestial equator. The next thing that is really interesting, and it's subtle, and it's something that we wouldn't notice generally in the course of our lives, but it's an effect of physics that is known as precession and precession of the Earth's orbit and it's got a really really long cycle time 26,000 years now the way we can think about this is in the same way that as a top spins it wobbles 
So if there's a fast rotation of the top, while it's spinning like crazy, the primary spin, it also wobbles around the whole top itself, wobbles without falling to the ground. It's really a matter of the conservation of angular momentum. But we're not going to worry about the physics here, just the phenomenon, the phenomenon itself. So the, in general, the Earth's rotational axis points to Polaris. So in any given year, it points in the same direction, but not quite. We say it's fixed in space, but not quite. Because if we could watch this thing for thousands of years, in fact, 26,000 years, we would see how it, how as the Earth spins around, it actually precesses or wobbles. So the orientation of the Earth's rotational axis sweeps an arc, actually a circle, through the sky in 26,000 years. That's pretty awesome. Let's take a look at the stars that it actually sweeps through in that amount of time. So here it is. And right now, we are at Polaris. This is just where we happen to be in history. And the Earth's orbit, the Earth's axis, is pointing within one degree of Polaris. 3,000 years ago, or, well, longer than that, 5,000 years ago. 3,000 BC, we were near this star here, Thuban. And in future times, okay, these it's shown a lot of stars here. They're not all so bright as they appear. But in 14,000 AD, that's a long time in the future, the pole star will be near Vega. But you notice that for the most part, the pole, the North Celestial Pole, isn't near any particularly bright star. And the best that it ever gets is right now. We're right almost on Polaris. And that's a very fortunate circumstance for those of us living in this present day. Aren't we lucky? So just a little bit on the cause of precession. Well, it has to do with gravity. It's the tug from the moon and the sun on the bulges of Earth. Right? And basically, the Earth, as it rotates, becomes an oblate spheroid. The equatorial regions are bulged out. So the moon tugs on this bulge. The sun tugs on this bulge. It puts a torque on the Earth to try and straighten it out. But the laws of the conservation of angular momentum cause it to precess instead. It doesn't just straighten out. It causes the motion to become perpendicular to straight across like that, and it precesses. Well, that's a little complex in detail. But because of that, there's also a side benefit, namely that this tug produces a stability in the axial tilt or the obliquity of the Earth. On a planet like Mars, which doesn't have any large moon, the axial tilt varies widely, so it flops back and forth over millions of years. Whereas in the case of Earth, the axial tilt varies between about 22 and 24 and a half degrees. Right now it's 23 and a half. So that's a wonderful side benefit to having a large moon. and is actually very important for consideration of advanced life. So we have precession, we have the variation in the axial tilt of the Earth, which isn't very much, but it's still significant. And then there's something called eccentricity, which is the non-circularity of the Earth's orbit. And that's just worth mentioning. It turns out that in January, the Earth is closer to the Sun than in June, July. And that's kind of surprising because, well, summer is in January, isn't it? For us, at least, in the Northern Hemisphere. No, it's not. That's, the, that's uh, winter. <laughs> in summer, June, July, we're further away from the sun. And in winter, we're f closer to the sun. So that seems maybe a little opposite, but that's the reality. And even though this is highly exaggerated, the difference in distances from Earth to sun at those times results in about a 3% difference or in, in distance, which is a 7% difference in the, in the influx of energy from the sun. Now that is actually a lot. So something that you may be concerned about is, in the southern hemisphere, January is summer, isn't it? Because the Earth is tilted toward the sun, 
in the southern hem hemisphere. In June and July, it's winter, and it's tilted away from the sun. So there should be more extreme temperature variations in the southern hemisphere. Well, there actually are, but it's not as severe as you might think, and there's a good reason for it. It only has minor seasonal influence in particular. And the reason can be seen when we look at Earth, our wonderful planet, where is most of the land mass? And you'd say, well, it's in the northern hemisphere. The southern hemisphere is most of the water. It turns out that water has a huge temperature stabilizing effect because of its large specific heat. It can hold heat in very well. And that moderates the temperatures over the globe so that this variation in the eccentricity or the ovalness, the ellipticity of the orbit does not cause the southern hemisphere to have such massive temperature swings as you might expect it to. Just a note on how those strange motions that we've just discussed come together to affect climate on Earth. A person by the name of Milankovitch, which put together these ideas in a statement that says that the variations of those three elements, precession, obliquity, and eccentricity, work together in the Earth's sun geometry to alter the amount of solar energy reaching Earth, and it affects climate. And so this is pretty complicated, but nevertheless, there seems to be a connection. So this is a non-precise graph of some of these effects. Precession, the 26,000 year cycle, shown here in the top. The obliquity variation, a 41,000 year cycle. And the variation in orbital eccentricity, a 100,000 year cycle, collectively producing a variation in solar energy, which seems to be correlated, to some degree at least, not very well understood, with ice ages and various stages of glaciation. So that's really interesting to think about and in fact very likely has a far more significant impact on Earth climate over long periods of time than any amount of additional greenhouse heating that humans can do by adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. So to understand some of these things a little more and other topics that we'll address. I'd like to invite you to uh, now click on the link about the orbital effects of Earth uh, a YouTube video. can't remember what I called it, but orbital effects, something like that for Earth. It's the next thing in the sequence, and we'll see you in the next presentation.